The Cure Chronicles is delighted to welcome Matt Webster to the show. Matt is a UK-based HIV AIDS advocate, HIV prevention educator, and a vlogger. In 2011, Matt was diagnosed with HIV. He decided to start sharing his story online in an effort to give others hope when navigating the challenges of living with HIV. Today, Matt is dedicated to using his knowledge, experience, and acceptance of his HIV status to help challenge misunderstandings and stigma around HIV through social media, volunteering, and having open conversations. Matt, I'd like to thank you for joining me on the Care Chronicles today. Hi, Jeff. It's, it's really nice to meet you, and thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this. It's really, yeah, really exciting thing for me to do. Thank you. And really, the pleasure is all ours. And I really love to get to meet people that are dealing with their HIV diagnosis. And I think that, the, you know, everybody has something to share about their experience that's valuable to the whole community. A uh, big concern of mine is the level of stigma surrounding HIV. And I think that brave folks like you that are willing to, you know, speak out and help to break the myth, mythology around HIV and, and talk about the reality really is really helpful for people to deal with this. And there's so many people dealing with it and it's, and it's less, less scary and less limiting than a lot of people think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also there's a, there's a reason to know your status. And I think, you know, that's something that is something that escapes the general public, but, you know, let's start with you. And, you know, the, I understand that you were diagnosed in, in 2011 for the uh, of having HIV, what was your situation at that point? Were you having some sort of symptoms of of the disease, or was it just coincidental that you happened to find out? Yeah, so um, yeah, so I got diagnosed in November two thousand eleven, and basically it came about because I was I was sick for about a week, and I had you know what was kind of fluy like symptoms, maybe kind of like a bad cold or something like that. So I had you know kind of aches and pains you know, a bit of fever. And I just, I just generally felt quite unwell. And it wasn't until, you know, quite late into the week when I developed like this, this rash down my arm, I kind of thought it looked a bit like something like meningitis. So I was kind of, you know, that's kind of when the worry started, you know, at first I wasn't gonna, you know, worry too much. It was like, I've got a cold or I've got a flu or just kind of, you know, right. have, have right. some lengths and get through it really. Right, but, right. We all get, we all get them, right? Yeah. We just suffer yeah. for 10 days or whatever and then we're fine, right? Yeah, yeah. that's it, exactly. And uh, yeah, but when I got the rash, I was kind of like, you know, this is, this is something else going on. I, I wonder what's going on. So I immediately went to my uh, GP who kind of, you know, checked me over and just did a few quick tests and things like that. And, and she was like, you know, this does look like meningitis, so I'm going to get you straight into hospital. So, you know, straight after the appointment, they, they rushed me into hospital, they admitted me onto the wards, you know, got me hooked up to a, a cannula and things like that. And then they, they kind of took a lot of blood, didn't really fully explain exactly kind of what they were testing for. So I still didn't really have any idea apart from meningitis and I was I was in hospital for kind of most of the evening I got a nice little meal when I was there and then they discharged me said it's, it's not meningitis but we'll you know we'll run these tests and we'll kind of get back to you and yeah and, and, and let you know what you know what what it is what's happened and I think it was about a week or two after being discharged <clears throat> that I got a call asking me to to go back into the hospital and at, at that point it was the I think it was the tropical or the infectious diseases clinic so at that point, then you kind of, the brain was, was over, overrunning then. And I was kind of wondering, you know, what have I got? What's, what's going on? So I went into, you know, into, into my appointment and got my results. And, and they just explained that it was asked if I'd been tested for HIV before. And I, and I you know, I hadn't because it was only, I'd only come out as gay about eight months ish beforehand. So I didn't really know a huge amount of, amount about it I didn't really know much about testing or you know even STI testing at that point so I hadn't ever thought of you know getting tested and yeah he kind of brought the news to me that one of the tests that they'd run as part of the uh, part of my admission into hospital was for HIV and then the result will come back positive at that point. Yeah so it actually sounds you know not that dissimilar to you know a large part of the population they do find it that way because they they don't test even if they think there's some possibility of exposure and i think anybody that's sexually active you know has some level of potential exposure 
After that, basically, you had a little bit of time to think about this before you start to getting into advocacy, because my, my understanding is that you started making videos around 2020. Can you tell us a little bit about you know wh- what motivated you to do that and, and tell us a little bit about the kind of advocacy or the kind of information that you were putting out? Yeah, sure. I mean, <clears throat> there was, you know, there was quite a long, quite a long gap there from 2011 to 2020. So I, I released my first video was, was for World AIDS Day in December 2020. And that's the kind of first time I'd really talked, <clears throat> talked publicly, publicly about my diagnosis. And, you know, I think it's, it's something that I'd kind of always wanted to do once I kind of got through my, my initial stigma and my initial kind of you know, challenges uh, of being diagnosed. It was something I kind of really wanted to do and talk a bit more publicly about it but I'd never really had the confidence to do it and I think kind of what what triggered me into actually you know you know making that step to, to talk publicly was a breakup with my my ex-partner and I was just kind of in a challenging place it was quite you know a long relationship and that kind of just triggered me into you know kind of thinking about my life and, and where do I want it to go what do I want to do and you know, I've always been I've always been kind of a supporter of World Days Day and you know gone to different events, including like a, a memorial. Like we do like a candlelit vigil by the the AIDS Memorial in, in, here in Brighton, and I was kind of like I just, I just really want to to do something and give something back, and I just had this idea in my head of of, uh, of making a video just talking about my diagnosis and my experiences with it. In you know I didn't have many kind of expectations for it. I just kind of wanted to. to just share my experience and just hope that maybe even just just one person would see it and kind of you know realize that you know living with HIV isn't such a such a you know a life destroying thing really. Oh, I think that's a great theme, and we hear that a lot on the Care Chronicles. That you know, once people really get an opportunity to think about it, and sometimes when they, you know, sometimes they have to be a little bit bold or, or, or you know, sort of take a leap of faith and start to share their diagnosis with others and to see where their support system is. That they find out that you know, living with HIV isn't that different than li- living without HIV. Yeah, that, that the pills are you know, not that toxic, you know, that you live a, a relatively normal daily life. And, you know, the it, it seems like some of the most difficult part of the diagnosis of HIV is that isolation when people don't feel comfortable, you know, sharing this information with their friends and family and being open about it. Uh, and that really comes from the stigma surrounding HIV, that it's a kind of a scary thing to people that don't understand HIV, that don't have HIV. I mean, okay, so, you know, give me a, a hallelujah on this or, a, you know, a, 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 a yes or no, if, you know, if this is your understanding as well. But my understanding is if you're down at undetectable, you're not contagious. You're no, you're, you're no more likely to give it to somebody else than somebody who doesn't have HIV giving it to somebody else. That's remarkable. Right. I mean, that can actually normalize even your intimate relationships. Uh, and and so it's it's really different than, you know, when I was back in college and the amazing fear of, you know, having that and realizing that you, you know, you had a either a secret or you had something that was that you would tell that might scare everybody away from you. Right. And it, it's interesting to have these conversations because I guess the more people that understand that situation the more normal it can become living with HIV, which is a, so it's great that you can't decide to, to come out. Do you mind, you know, come out about your diagnosis? Do you mind me asking you about what, what do you think? It, why did it take you eight years? Were you just having such a great relationship and it just, you never really thought about it and, or was there anything that was holding you back at the time? That's, that's a good question. It's, it's difficult to kind of really pinpoint exactly what it was that, that stopped me, whether it's the kind of, you know, just just my own kind of personal confidence and kind of you know being in the in, in a relationship and uh, you know just just going through the, the kind of normal day to day life. So I I think it was you know it's maybe even just becoming so comfortable with it that you know like you kind of mentioned earlier it's it's, it's a very normal day to day life, right? You know I, I take just one pill a day in the evening and that's that's it. I go for you know I go for tests for every six months. And that's it. So, you know, it's a really kind of small 
part of my life in terms of the kind of management and you know the, the the clinical side of things there's not you know a huge amount there so I think you know maybe just becoming comfortable with it becoming comfortable with life and just kind of getting on with it really I don't yeah I think it just really took that you know that that kind of big life event which was the breakup to kind of just just push me a bit further into kind of learning more about myself and again kind of where I wanted to go and you know the person I wanted to to be really yeah yeah so it sounds like it just took time right you just kind of got used to it and then you realized it wasn't you know you put it in perspective and and you still get tested regularly that's interesting so you know what is the purpose of that right if you're taking your pill every day you know so people still do go get tested every a couple times a year i guess it sounds like and and you know what's the what's the the purpose of that yeah sure so so yeah so get tested every six months it's just just blood tests and the kind of normal sexual health screen that, that I get every six months as well. So the, the test, uh, so here in the UK, they used to test the CD4 count, which is the is the white blood cell count in your body. Now they don't really do that anymore unless your viral load changes. So that's another thing the test is for viral load, which is the amount of virus that's in your blood. And they also check for, for things like, you know, liver, you know, liver condition, things like that. You know, although the meds that aren't, as toxic as they used to be you know there can still be a bit of an effect on your body so you know the check-in creatinine levels things like that just to kind of you know make sure everything's in check and just you know general kind of you know health checks and you know once a year they check my weight my blood pressure and just keep a really good you know a good eye on things there's actually i recently saw some research that was talking about people with hiv being diagnosed with certain things earlier than than people that don't live with hiv and actually the kind of the result of that was that because people in with HIV get tested more frequently and get checked on more frequently, then, you know, a lot of these things are found earlier in people living with HIV than people that don't live with HIV just because of the, you know, the, the kind of routine testing every six months, really. That's amazing because as you were talking about how you take, you know, normal management of your health, it made me realize you're doing a better job monitoring your health than I'm doing monitoring my health. I think that is great. And that makes perfect sense that, you know, you're getting these checkups and that's driven a little bit by the fact that you can potentially get some toxicities that are quite rare. And then I guess they just would adjust your drugs in that case. So it's not like that's a big deal. They, they, your liver, some liver enzymes are off and they're like, hey, why don't you go on this version of it instead? And yeah then adjust it and it, it still works the same way right because your viral load is so low that you're considered undetectable right yeah that's it yeah i mean you know there's, there's times when you know things start to go a little bit wrong and they can you know change change the treatment change the meds you know myself i so i started taking a tripler when i so basically when i when i got diagnosed you didn't used to start taking treatment straight away. You used to wait until your CD4 count started to drop when it sort of, when it was kind of slowly going down or it was below 350. That At that point was when they would start treatment. So when I started treatment, which is about three years after I got diagnosed, I started on a pill called a tripler, which was quite, quite strong. At the time I had quite a few side effects from it. And you know, not everyone does, it's quite a, you know, a rare, you know, a, a rare experience to have some side effects from it. And I think I was on triplet for about six to eight months before they changed me across to Strybuild, um, which is what I take now and I've taken ever since and I've had absolutely no problems with it. So yeah, you know, when things start to kind of go a little bit alright, then you know they can they can change the they can change the meds and and just kind of get things you know back on track. You know, occasionally you'll have like, you know, spike in your viral load. And, you know, just, you know, going every six months is just a really good way that they can keep an eye on things, make sure everything's going smoothly. And yeah, that everything is, is being kept in check. And, and how invasive is a HIV test? You know, like when they test your viral load or test, you know, what, what, how much blood do they have to take? So usually it's, I think it's like between four or between four and six, like little vials of blood. But this, I don't know if this sounds weird or not, but I, I quite enjoy going to the clinic and, and going for my appointments. The, the the nurses and doctors there are just, you know, absolutely amazed and have a good laugh with you and just, just make you really feel like at ease. And almost, it, it feels like a second home to me almost. Well, that's fantastic. Like that further, you know, normalizes 
a very normal situation. It is really nice, you know. The, so these are people that are happy to see you, that yeah. are you know kind of service providers, sort of showing you some love. Quite frankly, I mean, we could all use you know doctors' experiences like uh, doctors' appointments like that. You know, sometimes in I don't know if this is some sometimes the case in the UK, but in the United States, sometimes they have to really rush you inside in and out, so you never really get a chance to get some human interaction. But it sounds like the HIV clinics are really tuned. To, to that. And so the, so the blood draw is not a big deal. And so I know you're an advocate for testing and, you know, certainly managing your health has huge benefits like this. Are there other reasons for people to get tested? What if they don't know whether or not they have HIV? You know, there's a big fear of finding out. And I think you, you've sort of said already that, well, you know, it didn't turn out to be as big a deal as you might've imagined you know, I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but, you know, what other, you know, when you're talking to other folks in your community or your friends or family or whatever, what sort of things do you say about testing in general? I think, I think the biggest thing when I'm kind of talking about testing is how simple and easy, quick it is, you know, for most, you know, kind of initial HIV tests, it's just like, a, you know, a finger prick blood test, which takes, you know, takes minutes, but, you know, it's, it's one of the most but important. Even things. much less than your visit to the doctor that you described. Oh, yes, so that's yes. like nothing, a finger prick te test. Yeah. A, yeah, so a drop of blood is enough. Wow, yeah. amazing. So that's not very invasive at all. Mm. Uh, but what about the fear factor? You know, what, what, what would, you know, <laughs> is there anything that you can do that would encourage people to find out their status? Is it the right thing to do? Yeah, I mean, I think I think for people that are sexually active, no matter kind of what what you know what what sexuality or, or, or gender you identify as, I think it's it's testing is, is is vital. You know, we have you know goals to end new HIV transmissions by twenty thirty, and you you know the only way that you can really do it, you know, at present is is by regular testing, is by people getting tested. So you know, it's so important because if you don't know your status. And I think I think the figures are that around 20% of people that, that contract HIV don't get any symptoms. If you don't test, you you, you don't know what status what your status is. It's you know you could be passing it on, you know without without knowing anything really. I think it's you know for you know for for a really quick you know test which takes a few minutes, it's it's, it's so worth it. Yeah, and you can do something really. You're, what you're doing is you're doing something positive for humanity, right? Because yeah, yeah. you brought up the goal of ending transmission by 2030, right? And if everybody knows their status, we could, you know, reduce the transmission, you know, to nearly zero at that point, right? Because if, if all they need to do is get on meds, <laughs> suppress the virus, and go back to their normal lives yeah. without the fear of accidentally passing it to somebody else. Is there anything else that you would share with people that might you know, be dealing with some of the things that you were dealing with upon your diagnosis or as you were thinking about it and deciding whether to, you know, come out about it and, you know, in terms of managing your relationships and managing your health. I mean, you have the mic. Tell me, what, <laughs> tell me what's on, you know, tell me anything you can think of. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it, where to start really, you know, you kind of, you kind of touched, touched on earlier that, you know, it can be a really isolating experience is, an experience but it, it really can be you know it can be one of the most isolating experiences ever you know when I when I first got diagnosed I felt the most isolated I've ever felt you know I didn't I, I kind of went completely in on myself I didn't feel like anyone else was you know going through the same thing but you know there's there's hundreds of thousands there's millions of people across the world that are going through the same thing and you know for me what kind of really helped me to to kind of get over that was you know kind of give myself a bit of time to obviously let you know let the news sink in a little bit it's quite you know it was quite a big shock I was quite scared at the time and yeah there was a lot of worries and concerns but for me kind of what really helped was just just researching just reading talking to my doctors I eventually got to know a friend that was positive as well and just talking to him and kind of talking through you know his experiences and just kind of learn about how you know he he deals with you know his his diagnosis and you know how simple it is to kind of to kind of live with HIV. I think that was one of the biggest things that really kind of helped me kind of move forward in life from a point where I didn't think it was going to continue for much longer. Just to kind of really understand 
you know, I think I probably went into a bit too much detail, but I think just to really understand, you know, how, how HIV works and how the treatment works and, you know, the success of the treatment and how, you know, how great it is and how, you know, how quickly you can go from being detectable to undetectable. You know, I speak to people, you know, quite a lot of people reach out to me online and, you know, through social media and kind of, you know, talk to me that they're, you know, they're struggling, they've just been diagnosed, they're really struggling or they're worried. And, you know, you know, people from, from across the world kind of reach out to me. And, you know, one person I spoke to regularly started taking treatment and within two, three months he was undetectable. So it's, it's amazing how quick, you know, modern treatment does work. And, you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, that the kind of management of it is, is, is so simple. You know, one pill a day, there's not a huge amount of kind of, you know, different factors around taking the meds. I need to take mine with food, but, you know, some you don't, some you do. You know, generally have to take it around the same time every day, but, you know, it's such a, you know, taking one pill, maybe even two pills, a couple of pills, is, is not, you know, it's not a hard thing to do. And, and you know, I remember you know, I'd, I'd take my meds out with me if I was, you know, meeting friends or going for dinner. And I'd used to, I'd used to go and like hide when I needed to take my meds. Um, yeah. Because obviously I need to take it with food. So if I was kind of out around dinner time, then I'd go and hide somewhere or kind of, you know, take it on the sly without people, people noticing this was before I kind of started talking publicly. But, you know, now again, just kind of from talking to people from, you know, understanding more and more about, you know, how HIV works and, you know, the, the kind of the, the prognosis, which is, which is absolutely fantastic now, just now I don't care. I'll just kind of get it out and I'll take my pill and, you know, <clears throat> with everyone might even, see, start, might even start a good conversation when you yeah, think about it, it. Right. Cause I was just thinking, listening to you and you were saying that you met somebody who was going through the same thing and you got a, you know, a, got a chance to discuss it with, with him you know, how do you broach that subject at first, right? Did, did that person just mention it to you and you, and then you were like, well, I guess I can admit it to him as well. And then you had a great conversation or, you know, did you actually search around for somebody to talk to? And No, so it was the, the kind of the first guy that I, I talked to was a friend of my ex-boyfriend. And I think, I think my ex must have told him, you know, about my diagnosis and was like, you know, can you speak to Matt and kind of, you know, help him out a little bit. And so that's kind of how that started. And yeah. Do they sometimes ask you what, you know, why is that? Why are you taking a pill? And to be honest, no, because I've usually kind of told them about it before. You know, if I'm, if I'm taking it around friends, you know, I, I can't think of a friend of mine that doesn't know about my status. So yeah. I, That's it cool. Kind of, and it's, and yeah. it's just like, yeah. So there's a, there it, within your local community, it sounds like there's zero stigma from surrounding this. Yeah, and that's, that's an interesting point, actually. There's, there's, there's so in my, you know, circles, there's, there's little to no stigma. That, I mean, there was when I kind of first was diagnosed, first started talking about HIV. You know, and I'm not saying, you know, stigma is in a really kind of bad, negative thing. It's just people that don't necessarily understand or understand now how HIV works and you know what the prognosis is like now but yeah there was you know some challenges to go through in kind of telling people and then having to kind of you know almost feel like I needed to back myself up and say listen you know actually it's not it's not a thing don't worry I mean that's the kind of you know minority of, of times really most, most of the people I've talked to have been really good about it it's, it's more kind of in it's been in my head and I've been kind of worried and like, what are people going to think of me when they find this out? And what are people going to say about it? And will they start talking behind my back? And, you know, will I lose friends over it? But, you know, fortunately, nothing, nothing like that's happened. So it's been really, yeah, really positive experience. You know, that's really another thought that I have listening to you is that one of the things that you did is you decided to understand how HIV works and to get more you know, sort of almost like scientific details about it and that that gave you more confidence in, in speaking to people about it, which I think is a good thing. So, you know, at least you knew what you were talking about if they had a question, which is 
you know, that's, that's great. I, I wonder, is that something anybody can do? Or do you just have a knack for it? Because the other thing that struck me is that you looked at a rash on your arm and thought that maybe you had meningitis. And I'm like, how many people would know what meningitis looks like? <laughs> Did you go to the internet looking at rashes until you were like, oh, there's the one I have on my arm looks like because then you went down to the clinic and they were like, yeah, it does look like meningitis. Come on in. Yeah. <laughs> Which is impressive. Are, are you a doctor? <laughs> What's the story? <laughs> no, I know I, I'm not. I'm not in any medical profession. Profession I work. I work in HR, so it's yeah, obviously very different. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's, it's weird because I remember you know growing up in school and, and you know watching TV and seeing <clears throat> we used to have like you know public information adverts about meningitis where they'd say you know if you've got a rash and you kind of roll a glass you know press a glass against it and if the rash doesn't disappear it's you know possibly meningitis and I, I remember that yeah I don't know it's just it's, it's the kind of memory that, that stuck with me I don't, I don't know why it kind of stuck in my head from yeah from, from being a kid but yeah and, and, and interestingly you know where there was that much education on and this is probably going off on a, on, a, on a complete tangent here but where there was that much information about you know things like meningitis there was never the same around HIV or sexual health it was such you know a, a taboo subject you know growing up and yeah. You know, you know, like I kind of touched on earlier, I didn't know anything about HIV when I got diagnosed, apart from, you know, apart from what I'd seen and heard, you know, growing up and, you know, people were, you know, obviously getting really ill and, and, and unfortunately dying from, you know, from HIV, from, from AIDS. And so it was only those kind of stigmatizing views that I had in my own head at that point. Nothing kind of positive or, you know, constructive was in my head it was just a kind of yeah this is the most awful thing that's ever happened kind of thing if you don't mind me prying into your you know somewhat oh. personal stuff here but you, you know what why did you know why did you come out you know right around 2011 2010 sure yeah so i i have known that i was gay since i was about nine years old so i was born in 86 and i'd always known it but you know, kind of where, so I'm, I'm not originally from Brighton here in the UK. I, I used to come from the Lake District, which is a little bit further up north in a, in a really kind of small, small village. And it was, I think, I think mainly just the kind of worry about, you know, people's views on it and, you know, being scared of, of actually coming out and just, just not being ready to, to kind of make that, that leap. You know, I kind of wrestled, wrestled with, you know, with those thoughts in my head for, however many years that was until I was 20, 24. And, you know, the, the, there's so many times where, you know, I, I went to uni in the, in the northeast of England and I didn't, didn't come out there, even though I kind of knew, you know, some, some other people that were gay as well and had some kind of mutual, some friends that were, you know, friends of friends that were gay, but I never kind of felt right to do it on, on, until that point. And, you know, when I left uni, I moved back to my parents and I, I kind of moved with the thought in my head that I'm going to, you know, ignore these gay thoughts. I'm going to, I'm going to be straight. I'm going to find a girlfriend. I'm going to have a family. I'm going to live happily ever after. But as, as time went by, I just realized that that's, that's not what it is. You can't, I can't just change it. That's me. And kind of once, you know, I'd realized that, you know, it, it was time, time to do it. And, you know, I, I, it felt right at that point to do it. I was in a good place in my life and I was, you know, making lots of new friends and, you know, I was like, this is, this is time to, time to do it. And then, yeah, then about, I think about four or five months after I came out, I moved down to Brighton, which is a lot more accepting, a lot more you know, friendly than, than where I was previously. But you still did it where you were in the less gay friendly environment and sure. was it as bad as you thought it was going to be when it became open? Yeah. So it was another experience that you had where, you took a brave leap of faith and, and it worked out. Yeah, very interesting. Well, look, I, I, you know, that's, I, I think, you know, a really interesting part of your backstory as well. And I really appreciate you sharing that with me. Anyway, this has been a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. And I hope other folks listening in got a chance to get to know a little bit about you and enjoyed your story as well. I'm sure they did. So thank you so much for being with me today. No, thank you. Jim. We'll see you again sometime. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much for yeah for having me on. It's been been amazing. Thank you.